senior official from the European Medical Association has said that the available evidence now indicates that there may be a clear link between the AstraZeneca vaccine and rare blood clot events. So we're asking, does the benefit still outweigh the risk? And for more on this, we're joined by Professor of Immunology and Director of the Kathleen Lonsdale Institute for Human Health Research at Maynooth University, Professor Paul Moyna. Good morning, Paul. Um, This issue with blood clots, will you put some context on it for people, Paul? Because people are very worried about this. Yeah, good morning, Kara. Yeah, so so first of all, it's important to say, you know, when there's a sense that there may be some reactions to vaccines, that this is studied in detail, and that's what's being done at the moment. And th- there was a report yesterday, officially from the EMA, it indicated that there was a, a link. Now, the EMA has to formally uh, respond to that, and I think it's due to give a report in the coming days. So basically, early on, as the vaccine was rolled out, there was, a, there was some indications that maybe the incidence of sort of more common uh, clotting disorders like deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, you know, uh, clotting in the lungs, maybe that was increased uh, with the uh, AstraZeneca vaccine. Now, as it turns out, analysis was done on that and the incidence of that is the same as in the background population that hasn't been vaccinated. But in the last number of weeks, there's there's a rare uh, clotting disorder Uh, especially in the brain, in the vein that drains the blood from the head and the face. And there seems to be at least an increased incidence. It's very rare. But, for example, in the UK, where the AstraZeneca has been rolled out extensively, so 18 million people have been vaccinated with the AstraZeneca vaccine. And there have been cases of about between in the mid-20s cases of, again, this rare clotting disorder uh, in the brain. So they're looking at that now in more detail. And, for example, there was a study ongoing, for example, in teenage children with AstraZeneca and Oxford University and AstraZeneca have decided to pause that while we need its analysis. Now, even with those numbers, certainly, you know, the WHO announced yesterday and it's probably likely that the EMA will come out with the same conclusion that still the benefits far outweigh uh, the risk. And just, just on that point, because what I was saying to you at the beginning is, is people are worried about this. They, it is a balancing of risks always with, with, with vaccines. And, and what you're saying, if I'm right, is is that currently the risks of dying of something like COVID are about one in 200. The risk of getting this very rare cerebral thrombus, this clot to the brain, one in 200,000 or less, isn't it? So, so, so we're, we're talking about vastly different levels of risk here. Yeah, orders of magnitude. Like even in the UK, it's like sort of maybe less than one in a million. Some European countries are coming in, as you say, maybe one in 200,000. So there is still a big difference in terms of, even if there is, and the the association has to be proved. And there's research going on in terms of trying to get a better understanding in terms of if there is an association, why the vaccine may be triggering this very rare disorder. I should say as well, that's more common in younger people, uh, less than 50, and especially in women. So again, trying to get a handle on that. It seems to resemble quite a rare clotting disorder that some people get in response to heparin, which yeah. is actually used as an anticoagulant. So again, a lot of studies going on. Um, and just lastly, Paul, on the front of the Irish Times, an effort to consider easing rules for fully vaccinated people. This is the so-called vaccine bonus. You and I have talked about this before. Do you think it's the right move? Is it about time that something like this was brought about? I think so, Kira. Yeah, I think I think there needs to be some, and we need to see some benefits in terms of introduction of the vaccine. So rather than it being an all or none and waiting for everybody to be vaccinated, I think we need to use the benefit of that and gradually open up society. So I think this is a very uh, positive move. OK. Uh, and, and just a very final point. Uh, I think it was one in 75 of the population got COVID during January. Should they also be, I, I suppose, benefiting from, from the equivalent of an immunity bonus? We think it's likely that for six to nine months they're, they're going to be immune, which is much the same as we think the vaccine may work for. Um, why are we only focusing on the vaccinated rather than the infected? No, I'd, I'd fully agree. And I think certainly, you know, if somebody has antibodies, have, have been infected by the virus and have antibodies, I think they should be given the same status as somebody who's been vaccinated. And we clearly know now, and all the studies show that if you've been infected with the virus, you've really good, got really good protection, at least for, you know, eight, nine months and probably longer. So certainly I think we should be dealing with those. And I, I think it'd be really good to find out what the rate of infection in the population has been. You know, we need to do those seroprevalence yeah. studies again because numbers have been high now for a number of weeks and I think quite a sizable proportion of the significant percentage of the population has already been infected by the virus so it would be really interesting to to, to look at that. All right, look, thank you very much once more for talking to us this morning.